Hello. <laughs> um, th thanks for coming out. Um, we don't have a um, ton of things to say, and probably I figured that um, you know you you in the audience would have questions for us. Yes, uh, we hope. We <laughs> hope. But <laughs> but you know the it it took um it took an unusually long time to do. I think. You know, uh, I, I know I've told the story a thousand times, but um, she she bought dinner with me at a school auction. Um, we we talked about it. I've said no to been saying no to stuff for years, mostly reality, but TV or whatever. But um, and I said no to her that night. But her uh, Laura's first documentary was so. Beautiful, uh, a piece called uh, Sunset Stories about um, um, aging radicals in an old age home in Hollywood, sort of airing things out. It's impossible to see without becoming verklempt. She really understands Los Angeles. <laughs> and I figured that it was probably going to happen, have to happen anyway. And our sensibilities meshed, and you know, it's, you know, it was really swell. It was much better, more fun than I would have anticipated. That's so lovely. Thank you. Um, and I'll just start out by saying, because this is always a question we get, is how th the documentary came about and why I wanted to make the documentary. And um, I moved to Los Angeles in the 90s to go to graduate school and had a lot of uh, reservations about moving here. and had a lot of opinions about LA that even though I'd never lived here, I was reluctant to move here. And um, a few years after I, I got here, I started reading Jonathan. And it really, I really credit him for sort of changing the way I sort of saw Los Angeles and experienced Los Angeles. And, and I know that's true for a lot of people in the city. Um, and so that sort of planted the seed of the documentary. Um, and I always felt like there was such a, that his writing had such a sort of emotional power to it. Um, and it made me, Really, like see the see the city so differently, and sort of see that you know it doesn't have that kind of immediate charm of some cities, or kind of the maybe kind of uh, you know cultural heft that like a New York City has, but that it um, kind of grows on you slowly, and that you have to kind of work work for it a little bit. We have plenty of cultural. Okay, heft. fine. <laughs> We're sitting here in the Hammer Museum <laughs> for true. crying out okay, loud. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> um, yeah, no. It's, says it's, it's, says it's the woman from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was his writing was really meaningful to me and really powerful to me, and so that's that was sort of the beginning of it. And um, you know, I think that that there's a lot of resistance to making the documentary from Jonathan. He's a journalist and wasn't used to having the focus be on him. He's used to interviewing other people. And the way that I think we sort of came together on how to work on this together was that it was really a, a film about Los Angeles through his eyes. Um, because that's how I, I, even though his writing is definitely about food and restaurants, it's really about culture and the city at large, so. If you were wondering why there are no scenes on the west side. <laughs> Which I'm sure at least some of you have been. <laughs> we'll get that question, I'm sure. <laughs> so I guess, are there any questions? If you could uh, please wait for a microphone. Okay. When did you do the filming? What year? I mean, because at Atari restaurant you showed, I think it doesn't exist. Atari, yeah, it's if, if, not if it does, not in the form that you had it. I think things changed. Anyways, when was it filmed? Uh, we started in 2010, I think. Yes. And uh, I think she uh, kept on filming until about 10 minutes before <laughs> the deadline to Sundance last year. This is true. Yes. <laughs> But Atari's still there. Is that what you're asking about? Uh, Atari's definitely there. You know, you 
go there and get your cuckoo it's sandwich. It's down the street. It's as good as ever. And believe me, there aren't a lot of great options to eat in Westwood you should know about. <laughs> <laughs> Up there in the back. You, yes, the, right there. What's your present opinion about Central Market? Um, it's, I go to the Grand Central Market a lot. I mean, maybe four times a week, and if you count like the number of times I go to the G&B coffee, maybe that's up to 10 or 11 times a week. <laughs> I mean, it's, when, you, when you have to have two or three cortados a day, it's like, <laughs> it's the place to go get them. Um, in some ways, I think that it may have tipped for good, that sometimes it's slightly sad to see you know, families who have been going there for years and years and they want ice cream and the stand that sold $1.50 cones is gone and, you know, they go to McConnell's where you get a tiny scoop of, you know, salted caramel, whatever, and it's four fifty. And even though there are a lot of the, you know, ro roast to go is there and honest is still there and there's the great Marilia Carnita stand and the Salvadoran place is still there. You get the feeling that it has shifted. I think the thing, the last move that did it for me was when the, um, I guess the, the liquor store up at front, which it must be admitted specialized in selling um, extremely cheap wine to <laughs> people who probably spent too much money on extremely cheap wine. Uh, but you go by there and there's nothing for what the neighborhood used to be. They have, you know, $130 bottles of single barrel 14-year-old rye. And it may be for what the neighborhood has become, but it's definitely a different place. I'm a restaurant critic. I'm out of La Tech. I have a favorite restaurant. Over there. Um, I really thought it was very fantastic film. I really thought it was really entertaining. Um, Jonathan, if you could only have one meal for one week, you know, just one, what would it be if it was like a four course meal? I mean, I'd have to have the same four course meal every day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I that, that's a yeah, that's a new question. That's a, that's a hard one. Uh, you know, I, I suppose maybe like a really good, a really good standard Italian meal with a really with a really nice roasted vegetable antipasto with uh, a a pasta that. You know, a, a handmade pasta with uh, really nice ragu. Since it's one meal all week, maybe a duck ragu. That's so delicious. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, so, something nice off the grill and, um, you know, <laughs> biscotti with Vincento. You can eat that every day, almost. <laughs> and if you go to Tuscany, you probably will. Have you traveled to a lot of the places and eaten food where these dishes that you eat in LA originated? I've been to a lot of them. I haven't been to all of them. Um, it's it's necessary to travel, I think, to like realize how cuisines map across different countries. How you go, you go down, you know, the Italian boot and the way that pasta is prepared changes every 20 miles. That you go to Korea and you realize that, you know, somebody will do a cabbage kimchi in one town and then 15 miles away they might put some anchovy in and 15 miles north it might be slightly spicier. And I mean, cuisine corresponds very closely to places 
on the land. But I I haven't traveled as widely as I want to, maybe, but I've, I've traveled enough. And it's always fascinating to realize that some version of a dish that I've loved in Los Angeles is either just extremely better in the land of its birth or maybe isn't quite as good. Hi, Jonathan uh, and um, Laura. Um, so you started off saying that you said no a lot to this being done. I'm just wondering if any restaurants have ever said no to you reviewing them because either they're afraid they're going to get too popular or, or any other reason. And then also to, to um, include the film in this, was there any, anything that uh, where you, you know, were declined to film or appear in the movie? Um, first off, I mean, I go into restaurants and I eat. And they, don't they don't necessarily know they're being reviewed. But there was a, I won't name it, but you'll know exactly what it is. There's a really expensive, slightly weird sushi bar in uh, Canoga Park that... <laughs> Uh, that uses a lot of truffle oil and gold leaf. And the guy's really good at buying fish and he's really good at preparing it. And the, I mean, the net is always great and the, the way that the rice is prepared is always great. But um, when we sent the photographer to take the picture for the Times, um, he wouldn't let the guy in the restaurant. He said that he'd been reviewed once and it brought the wrong kind of people into his restaurant. And I, you know, I, I, I suppose that's his right. Um, and for places that we wanted to have in the film that we didn't, I mean, we filmed so many places, it was probably 40 or 50. Um, there were ground rules. I, it was only restaurants that I had already reviewed and obviously reviewed pretty favorably. I'm not, you know, we weren't going to devote screen time to a place that I'd been sort of snippy about. And um, she wasn't allowed to film the process of reviewing, though I think we went to a few meals so she could see how I did it. But I'm not aware of being turned down by anyone. Are you, you probably know no. better than I do. I mean, no, I mean, we, we just, we, both, we mostly went to the places that have already been vetted by you. Yeah. So that wasn't really an issue. Um, because of the ground rules, it wasn't really an issue, I think. But, you know, I, I, I would have been sad if, like, Changju Taste or somebody had said no. I mean, it's, it's the, food, the food is so good there, and it's such an important restaurant, and it's so nice to be able to see people cooking behind the scenes, you know, the sort of magic that goes into it. I'm sorry, I'm making get a cardio workout. <laughs> having, having myself wor worked for Edward R. Murrow and Walter Cronkite and done a lot with documentaries, this is just a terrific, terrific picture. And I... Thank and you. I, Thank you. And I, I hope that you're going to have it reproduced in a book form or, and in video forms so that people all over this country can see this. It's a wonderful tribute to the city of Los Angeles, as well as a, certainly a tribute to you, both of you for what you've done here. Thank you so much. Um, book form, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm working on a book on uh, the history of Pico Boulevard now. Which, uh, so some of that's going to go into that. But um, certainly the film's going to be distributed all over the country. And I think a, uh, IFC, who's the company that's putting out, signed a deal with Hulu. So I, th I think this fall it will be, you know, running on Hulu until... Forever. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> we hope, we hope. <laughs>
March 11th, it's opening in New York and LA, um, and then it's expanding to about 30 other markets after that. And it's opening, I think Claudia already mentioned this, but it's um, Westside Pavilion and Hollywood Arclight here in March 11th. <laughs> you are making him run. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, so um, LA is, you know, always changing and, and reinventing itself. Um, and I was just wondering, um, you know, one of your colleagues at the Times, Christopher Hawthorne, has spoken at length about, you know, the third LA. Um, and I was wondering, had, have you had any conversations with him about how that impacts, you know, um, how we all mix and integrate and, and, and how that affects food? Um, or if you haven't talked to him, if you have any thoughts on that yourself. No, I, I haven't really talked to him much. Um, my, my wife is his editor, so it wouldn't be impossible <laughs> to arrange, I suppose. And, you know, I suppose that in whatever way, uh, in whatever shape the new Los Angeles is taking food, uh, food is a part of it. I mean, restaurants are in the neighborhood's uh, before any in new neighborhoods, before anything else is, and you can track um, sort of like w waves of immigration and the way that people are moving across the city with food almost and restaurants almost more accurately than you can with anybody else. I mean, it's I apparently knew about the. Um, Laotian community in Anaheim before the demographers did. <laughs> and because I was looking for that dried fish dish. Look right here in front. Um, I think I heard earlier that uh, you initially declined um, doing this doc, or you resisted doing this documentary, but it also seems like you've generally resisted kind of becoming a public figure, um, I guess especially when you were an anonymous uh, food critic. Um, but now we have so many um, chefs and food writers who are these public figures, like yet Andrew Zimmern in the movie and all that, and he's on TV, and we got Bourdain and all that. Um, why, why have you basically just resisted becoming that larger public figure that other people in the food world have become now? Because, because I'm I'm a writer, and r writing is by far the most important thing to me. It's it's what I do. I mean, some of the film is about what I am, and which is nice. And when I I've obviously done the Good Food Show on KCRW for almost twenty years, um, and I I I love. Yeah, as much as I, I love print, and as as wet as I am to that, you know, it's nice to be be able to put opinions and ideas about food out in other media too. Um, it's just I don't know. I'm a writer. I write. It's it, it's it's what I do. TV people like being on TV. It's what they do. How do you find out about all these places? Like, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously I'm at the I'm the critic at the LA Times now, so there's, I it's my responsibility to review mainstream restaurants as well as ones that aren't, and you know the important new place in town I'm going to get to, and sort of everybody knows about that, but otherwise I spend a lot of time poring over foreign language newspapers. I mean, I don't, I obviously don't read a word of Khmer, but there'll be like an ad for a restaurant, it'll be the address and I'll know if it's a place I haven't ha I haven't seen before and maybe I'll go check it out. Um, there are a lot of news, foreign language newspapers and thank God for Google Translate, because it's a bad translation, but you, at least you can sort of figure out what they serve and where they are and um, infer what part of you know, China or Korea they might be from. And you know, there's no 
substitute for shoe leather, trying, you know, lots of places out driving. I drive all around the county in my truck um, almost every day. Um, I still miss a lot of places, and I don't quite have the feel, I don't have the feel uh, all to myself at all the way I did, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but I, I find enough, it's fun. Can I just take one moment to um, introduce a few of our collaborators on the film who are here? Um, if you can stand up. Um, Andrea Lewis, one of the producers on the film. Can you please stand up? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> um, Gregory King, one of our editors, wonderful editor. And um, Jamie Wolf, our executive producer. Jamie, are you here? Who I have to say was the earliest, earliest and only supporter of this film. So, thank you. Um, as a reminder, please wait for the microphone uh, before asking your question. Um, more, than a more than a lunch at Spago. <laughs> less than a house in Brentwood. That's my go-to answer now. I like that. <laughs> it didn't cost very much. <laughs> Hi there. My uh, my question is about uh, Jonathan Gold, the cook. So I noticed uh, in the last scene of the movie, it was the first scene we saw you uh, preparing your own food. And I'm curious um, if you have had a dish at a restaurant that you've inquired about how they make it and tried to make it at home. And uh, how often do you cook? And uh, what do you think the relationship between your cooking is and, and your work and your life? Uh, I cook all the time, almost every day. I mean, a lot of times when I go out to dinner, I'll, I'll cook, you know, dinner for the family and before I go out. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm at farmer's markets every weekend. Um, I'm, you know, the, I'm that obnoxious guy at the spice store who in, insists on, you know, sampling the six different kinds of fennel pollen to see, see which one is most fragrant that day. Um, but the food I tend to cook at home ten is the food that's really hard to find in sort of its original form in Los Angeles. So I, li I live in Pasadena, and I'm 25-minute drive from the best you know, Asian restaurants in you know, North America. But I can't find great French food for all the tea in China. So I tend to cook more Mediterranean stuff because that's he hard does a, to He find. does a really good roast. <laughs> meat. meat. So much meat. 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 I wear it well. Jonathan, I wonder if you uh, missed the old LA Weekly and what it was like for you working there. Well, I loved the Weekly. I started working there right out of college. Um, the the politics of the, the the rather far left politics of the place fit me, um, and I I loved the sort of freewheeling nature of it. The way that you know. You know the the person in pay step would end up being in L seven, and the messengers would wind up forming Guns and Roses, that sort of thing. Um, and I thought it caught the energy of the city in a really good way. Um, when I left, the current the ed editor in chief at the time had not ironically a um, photograph of Ronald Reagan up on her wall. And it wasn't really a place that spoke to me anymore. I'm sorry. I know we're not allowed to be political, but it's <laughs> okay. You, yes. Uh, 
Um, first of all, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what a lot of people have said. Great film. Uh, as a transplant, I feel a lot of people don't really understand why you would move to LA. So I'm very excited to know that um, the rest of the country will be able to watch this film because I feel a lot of my friends will understand why I love this place so much. But um, yeah, it really is great. Uh, but my question was, the film kind of touches on uh, Yelp and how that has changed the way people eat out and how we all kind of think we have a small food critic within us. So I was wondering how you feel um, you know, about Yelp and similar apps and what technology has done in the way we share food and how we find places to eat. Um, I actually, I think, like Yelp or value Yelp more than most of most restaurant critics do. Um, I think it's really bad as, at rating restaurants. Uh, I think it's, the, the, the opinions tend to be pretty one dimensional. I mean, writing criticism, evaluating a restaurant takes a lot of work. I'm much better at it than I was 10 years ago, and 10 years ago it's much better than I was 10 years before that. It takes a long time to sort of be able to f figure things out and to um, be able to sort of catalog references and be able to put things in context. In the, in the same way with music, right? If it, you know, if uh, Taylor Swift was the first thing that you ever heard, and you might love Taylor Swift or you might hate Taylor Swift, but you have no way of putting her in the context of music or the history of music, and your opinion is delightful, perhaps, but perhaps not important. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but what what Yelp does Yelp in its inclusiveness, I think, is valuable. You know, the little badge they give for people for first to review mean, means that people review a lot of stuff. People will have at least popped into places. And their opinions of it may not be accurate. And they may even misidentify what it is that they're eating. But they've been there, and they leave traces. And it's either interesting or it's not interesting. And also because of its inclusiveness, you have, I know this is an example I use a lot, but you know, if there's a place in Hacienda Heights that's designed to appeal to the palates of 16-year-old Taiwanese kids, what a 16-year-old Taiwanese kid thinks of it is not irrelevant. And, it lets, and Yelp lets us access that. Hi, concerning the film, may I ask why it took so long to make it and if you were concerned about anything becoming totally irrelevant, such as a restaurant closing down or that sort of thing. And while you were making the film, did you find that your own personal relationship became such that you're now closer friends or were you friends to begin with? <laughs> That's a tough one. There were films that closed down in the making of it. I mean, that uh, that sort of the Mexico City style restaurant where I had the uh, the pombos, pombosos and the uh, salsa de semilla near the beginning of the film. They actually didn't make it, I and mean, they closed probably six months after the interview. And they moved to the middle of Iowa, and they're serving Mexico City street food to farmers. I actually kind of want to go there. <laughs> and then Fomin, too, which didn't end up in the film, but there was a Vietnamese restaurant that was in the film for a while that ended up getting cut out, that shut down. Yeah, the, the, there was, a, at one point in the film, or the version that showed at Sundance, there was a scene at a restaurant called Pho Min, which I think is probably the best pho restaurant there's ever been in Southern California. It's one of those classic stories, right? The, 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 the son of immigrants, you know, a really, you know, horrible, like, passage to America. I think he was studying engineering in the... Bay Area, and he decided to chuck it all and open a pho shop. 
and his parents were absolutely appalled and then you know pit, pitched in and helped them do it but there was just a there was a clarity of to the broth there was sort of a you know bounce and a sprightliness to the noodles there was there was a real presence to it and it's it's really sad the place is gone yeah and um, the scene's gone too actually yeah um, and then I think that, that, I mean, just in terms of, like, subject and filmmaker, I think that, um, I mean, I I say this all the time, but I think documentaries are only as good as the trust that allows them to be made, and I think that it takes a long time to build that trust, and I think that, you know, it took five years to make it, but that's actually not so unusual for a documentary. I mean, they, they tend to take a long time to make. Um, uh, and I think that you and I kind of found our rhythm in making the film a, a few years into it. Yeah, I mean, th there aren't that many scenes from that are there from the first couple of years. Yeah. And, so, and sometimes when I look at them, it's almost embarrassing. Those are the scenes where I'm basically by myself at a table and <laughs> there are 47 plates of food in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Which, believe me, is not how it works. Sometimes he was ordering food for the crew, too, so it looks like he's eating all that food. <laughs> he's actually not eating it. But uh, I mean, one funny thing about the passage of time is that, you know, my, my boy uh, was eight when his scenes were, were filmed. And he's 12 now and is really mad that... <laughs> the Leon in the movie is still a little kid. <laughs> I'm right in the middle. Yeah. You. What are you doing next? <laughs> Who, Jonathan or me? <laughs> um, I am in the early stages of production on a documentary about Mark Bradford, who had a show here at the Hammer in September. Very, very early stages, but it's exciting. I'm enjoying it a lot. I can't wait to see it. OK, I have the mic this time. Um, my question is, when in your film, you talked about how Los Angeles is kind of a megapolis of 177 satellite cities kind of converged into a big region. And that gives us a different fabric compared to other cities like New Orleans or Albuquerque, where there's a big regional use of food that is local around there. Do you think that's better or worse for Los Angeles? Oh, I think it's, I think it's in ways it, ma it makes us much harder to govern, and I don't think it's necessarily good for the commonweal. But I think for cuisine, it's brilliant that, you know, you have... You know, you have people in Koreatown and Little Saigon and Little Ethiopia cooking meals for basically themselves, and we get to partake of the food in kind of its uh, best, fr freshest form, as opposed to, say, in a city like San Francisco or New York, where if you open a Burmese restaurant, it could be an absolutely fantastic Burmese restaurant, but you're absolutely aware that most of your customers aren't going to be Burmese. And so the food changes. And one last question, I think. <laughs> no. Yeah, you know, it just occurred to me. Um, was there ever a time when you reviewed something and then later realized, man, I was wrong. It's actually really, did that ever happen? I mean, I guess that's hard because you'd have to return to a place that you didn't, you know. I mean, yes, early in, early in my career in the 80s, my first review for the old California magazine, uh, I wrote about Chasen's, uh, which, I mean, probably most of you in the room know, but it's like a sort of the old line showbiz restaurant in uh, West Hollywood. And... I went back a bunch and considering, you know, sort of who I was, they were they were really nice to me, and I sort I treated it as a um, s sort of a, a, meta a metaphor for 
you know, what I saw is the, you know, the, the Reagan administration, the sort of rich and poor thing. I read a lot of stuff into it that was subtext into it. That was definitely there, but it wasn't the entire thing, you know, making fun of, like, you know, seeing people like Jimmy Stewart and Joel McRae or seeing Nancy Reagan eat with Betsy Bloomingdale, that kind of thing. And to, to be fair, a lot of the food was not so good. I mean, canned vegetables and, um, you, you know, banana pudding that was like something you get at a kid's birthday party. <laughs> but then it was a generous place. And when it closed, I really missed it. I don't think I killed it. But I probably put a I, I put a I put a lance in its side, maybe. I, I don't think it had ever gotten a bad review before. And you know, all the things that I was praising at the time, you know, with you know, caviar rattlesnakes and uh, beef raised with kiwis and uh, y you know, blue torn, blue corn whatevers and whatever, you know, the fads were in the eighties that I thought at the time were the second coming, I realized were just super transitory. So I'm actually much more careful and much more circumspect now. I mean, this is a story I've told a lot. Is it in the movie, this story about that Taiwanese restaurant? Oh, but there was a restaurant that I went to once that, I've told the story before, so. You mean the 18 times? The, 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 yeah. yeah, it's in there. but. You know, going to a restaurant and absolutely hating it the first time I went in and realizing that it was my own cultural presuppositions that were the problem and not the restaurant itself. And going back until I actually understand it. That being said, a lot of restaurants really suck. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.